Um, Hever, I want to speak to you this afternoon about a famous story which requires a tremendous amount of analysis. All of you are, f are aware of the story. From the time that we are little kids, from the time that we are in kindergarten, we are told of this story. Am I speaking too loud, by the way? Is it better without the mic? With the mic? With the mic better? Yeah? Okay, because I can get loud. If it gets too loud, let me know. This story is a story that we're familiar with from the time that we're in kindergarten, from the time that we're in nursery, we're told the story of called Kamsa and Bar Kamsa. You familiar with the story? And Bekitsur uh, Nimratz, I'll just run through it very quickly, and then we'll actually look at the text because I want to show you that it's not so simple. But the story goes that there was a fellow, a wealthy fellow, he had a big uh, shebang, uh, must have been uh, maybe his daughter's wedding, whatever it is, maybe a deal uh, beach party. And sure enough, no pun intended, just a little uh, jab over there. So sure enough, he wanted to have a, he had a big party and he invited many people, but uh, he didn't like this particular fellow uh, named Bar Kamsa, but he liked this guy Kamsa, and he sends a guy to send a messenger to get him to come to the store, to the celebration. And he invites the wrong guy, he invites Bar Kamsa, and Bar Kamsa he hates, and he comes to the party and he says, get out of here, and he has a bouncer, and he bounces him out. And Bar Kamsa gets ticked off and he goes and he says to the Roman Emperor, you know, the Jewish people don't like you. And the Roman Emperor says, how do you know? And, and he puts a blade, says, well, if you give a korban, if you give a sacrifice, you'll see that the Jews will not accept the sacrifice. So Bar Kamsa takes the animal that the Roman Caesar gives him and he puts a little blemish inside his mouth and some say it's in his eye. And it's not acceptable to the Jews, but it's acceptable to the Romans. And the Jewish people don't know what to do. Should we sacrifice? Should we not sacrifice? What do we do in terms of the parameters of the Jewish? community and so on and so forth and in the end of the day we all know that presumably this resulted in the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash familiar with the story now I'm going to show you that you're unfamiliar with the story look for a moment at the text that you have in front of you and I'd like you to work with me because I'm exhausted it's Tisha B'Av and none of you are fasting so there's no reason why you should be tired the Talmud tells us as follows work with me and tell me what I'm just kidding the Talmud tells us as follows tell me what exactly is wrong and problematic with this text. Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Yochanan said, my dichtiv, what is it that it says in Mishlei? Quote from Shlomo HaMelech, King Solomon writes Mishlei, and he says as follows, Ashrei Adam Mefached Tamid, praised is the person who is consistently afraid. Umakshele bo yipo beraa, and a person who's makshelev, what is makshelev? Hardens his heart. In other words, he doesn't recognize the events that are transpiring around him as being divine, as being a, a, a mess, messenger from God, and so on and so forth. Yipobara, that person will fall into bad tidings. Now, where exactly do we see Makshel Yibo from? Where does it come from? Yafe. Paro. We have the chizuklev, kashelev, the hardening of the heart of Paro, and therefore he's obstinate and refuses to send the Jewish people out. Continues the Gemara. Al kamsa ubar kamsa chorva Yerushalayim. It's a very strange way to start the statement of the Gemara, of the Talmud. Al an kamsa and bar kamsa. Yerushalayim was destroyed. Presumably, when the Gemara, when the Talmud uses its various vernaculars, it starts off with Tanu Rabbanan, the rabbis learn. Tanya, we learn in a Brisa. Tanan, we learn in a Mishnah. It's very strange. Al Kamsa Ubar Kamsa Chorva Yerushalayim. On this particular issue, this story, Yerushalayim was destroyed. And you and I know that it's also ridiculous to entertain. Because you cannot propose that simply from one story of this fellow Kamsa and Bar Kamsa that they were the cause of the destruction of Yerushalayim. And you'll excuse me, but that's utterly ridiculous. But the Talmud says, what happened? Haya Adam Achad, she'ahav et Kamsa v'sana et Bar Kamsa. By the way, those are two very powerful emotions. He loved Kamsa and he hated Bar Kamsa. Hatred is very rarely used in the context of the Torah. Very rarely. Because hatred is very, very powerful. There are very few times when we are directed to hate. Uh, the one time you don't find classically in the Jewish community, but where the Chachamim use it in Pirkei Avot. Yeah? 
usna at the rabbanut. Al tasum kardum lachbor bahem. Do not use your rabbinic authority to assume a certain amount of uh, of uh, position, right? To be an authoritative figure that's way beyond your stature. Ve'al tasum usna at the rabbanut and hate. The rabbanut, hate, no, it's not the rabbanut, that doesn't mean hate rabbis. It means hate the rabbanut, the position of the authority. In other words, don't search to be a rabbi or a community leader in order to assume your status. That's problematic. That's when sna, the sno, hatred is used. But uh, if the Gemara tells us that this fellow hated Bar Kamsa, there's a reason why he does so. It's an extreme emotion whereby he truly hated this person with a passion. Asa suda, he made a suda. Amar le shamsho, he said to his servant, his entrusted messenger, Lech vehazmen le suda at kamsa, go and invite kamsa. She oto an yohev, because that guy I love. Halach hashamash vetevi betaut et bar kamsa hasano. And this fellow made a big whopper mistake. And instead of going to uh, kamsa, he went to bar kamsa. And he invited the guy that he hates. The head of the meal, the head of the entire party, the balabayit, he finds this fellow, Bar Kamsa, sitting at a table eating. Imagine, this fellow Bar Kamsa, not only does he hate him, the guy shows up and he's eating his entire sushi bar. Yeah? I mean, he's stuffing and fressing his face, and here he is sitting at his party, and he's supposed to have a good time. It's his daughter's wedding, and the guy that he hates, not only is the guy that he hates there, but he's enjoying eating, schmoozing, socializing, free bar, open bar, draft beer, sushi bar, smorgasbord, and whatever else you call it, yeah? So now he's really ticked off. And he says, what are you doing here? I came He says, listen, now that I'm here, do me a favor, and I'll pay for my meal but uh, don't deny me entry. Amalo balabait lo, say me kan, no dice. Get out of here. Eten lechadme chatzich zudatech, I'll pay for half the banquet. Lo. Eten lechadme kol zudatech, I'll pay for the entire banquet. Lo. Obstinate. Get out. Not lo, now listen to the description of what the Gemara, the Talmud tells us. Unbelievably graphic. Not low be a dove midovo tzio achutza. Doesn't just say that they hotzio achutza. Not low be a dove mido. It was a big debacle that was going on here. It was a debasement of this fellow. Imagine, uh, that's why I said bouncer, right? So it's, it's hard to, to uh, imagine this. But, you know, sure enough, you go to clubs. Uh, not that I have personal experience, but you go to clubs uh, in New York City, or whatever it is, or discos, or pubs, or whatever. They have guys called bouncers. You know, they're like, you know, seven foot tall and 400 pounds, and they're there for this reason. Because if there's resistance, they are going to bounce you out. So that's literally what happened. He lifted him up by his shirt tails, pounds him up in the sky, and throws him out in front of everyone. So there's a tremendous amount of fanfare that goes on. What happened? Amar Bar Kamsa, Bar Kamsa said, Ho'el v'yashvu sham chachamim v'lo michu b'yado, ki nireh shenoach lehem b'zeh. Since the chachamim were sitting there and they watched and they witnessed the event and they didn't protest, it seems like it's okay with them. It sits well with them. Elech v'al shina lehem l'fnei ha'melech. I'll have mine. My day will come. And I'll go and tell the king against them. Halach ve'amar le'kesar, he goes to the Caesar. Mardu becha ha'yudim, the Jews are rebelling against you. Amar lo, the Caesar says, unbelievable. Minayinli, how do you know that? Amar lo, shlach lem korban v'tereshu le'yakrivu oto. Go bring a, the, my right side's better. Go bring a korban and I'll show you that he doesn't, he won't, he won't uh, give, he won't offer the korban. Offer a korban, they won't offer it to Jewish people. Shalach biadav egel. He gave Bar Kamsa a. I was just kidding. He gave Bar Kamsa a egel, a calf. Kishebal akriv. When they came to offer it as a sacrifice, he tiobo mum besfataim veyeshom rimbaayin. 
they, they placed, Bar Kamsa placed a blemish. He blemished the lip of the animal. Some say the eye of the animal. We have to ask, what the heck is the difference? Because the fact is that he blemished the animal in such a position that it would not be acceptable by the Jews, but it would be acceptable by the Romans. What's the big deal? So it has a little blemish. And what happens? The rabbis calculated and thought, ah, maybe we should bring the korban. Why? Because if we don't do so, we jeopardize the position of the Jewish community in Rome. Rabbi Zechariah ben Avkulas. Rabbi Zechariah ben Avkulas, by the way, was presumably what we call the Gadol Hador, what you would call Maran. Did I say it right? Eddie. Maran. You would call Maran, the Mara da Atra, the chief rabbi. Rabbi Zechariah, but by the way, Rabbi Zechariah ben Avkulas is virtually only mentioned in the context of this particular Talmud. We don't hear about him anywhere else. And we'll see why. If he's such a mighty and powerful rabbi, he only had his one stand here. That was it. And we'll see why. What did he say? Amru bali mumen kreven al mizbeach. If we allow this korban, this sacrifice to be offered, people will from here on in, they'll say, oh, you know what? You're allowed to be makriv. You're allowed to offer a sacrifice that has a mum, that has a blemish in it. Serious halachic parameter. Chashvu l'arogat bar kamsa. They thought, let's kill bar kamsa. Shalom yelech v'yel shun le'kesar. This way he won't be able to tell the Caesar what's going on. Amarab Zechaya, listen to what he says, it's outrageous. Amru Matil Mum Bakodshim Yarek. Rab Zechaya said, Well, if we kill Bar Kamsa, what will they say? What will people huh? <laughs> Anybody who makes a mum in a korban deserves death. Could you imagine how ludicrous Rab Zechaya is? Excuse me. It, it, it didn't fathom, he didn't think for a moment that maybe there's a problem here of Lotir Tzach. That you're killing a fellow Jew, one of the big ten, ten commandments, aseret adibrot. Did he not think for a moment that maybe there's a problem of adam uh, yishafech, that he's spilling the blood of a Jew? Yes, maybe, maybe this fellow Bar Kamsa would have a din, a halachic status of what's called a rodef, where he's interested in jeopardizing the lives of Jewish people. So let him say, I'm not sure if Bar Kamsa is a rodef. Let's figure it out if he's punishable by death or not. That's not what he says. People will say, oh, all these rabbis, they're so halachic, the halachic calculation. People will say that someone who brings a korban with a mum is punishable by death. Oh, please. That's the problem here? And then sure enough, the Gemara says, Amar Rabbi Yochanan, and Rabbi Yochanan criticizes Rabbi Zachariah, it is truly unbelievable. Says Rabbi Yochanan definitively, the anvetanuto, the impure modesty, the fake humility of Rabbi Zachariya ben Avkulas caused not only the destruction of the temple, but the destruction of Jerusalem. And not only the destruction of Jerusalem, but the exile of the entire Jewish people. Now, my friends, you tell me what is problematic with this entire story. And there are a lot of questions that you could ask. So work with me. I'll start you off. Question number one. The first pasuk that appears itself in the context of the Gemara is a pasuk from Mishle. Right? And what is the pasuk? Praise the person who is always consistently afraid. Whenever the Talmud presumably brings a pasuk, then we have to understand what is that verse, what is the connection between the significance between that verse and the context of the Gemara and the story of the Talmud. Legitimate question? Question number one. Now work with me in the story. Problems. Now, go ahead, I don't care, go for it. Ah, 
Oh, <laughs> didn't even think of that question. But that's, they did. They, because, they, because for their gods, so to speak, it had to be a semi-complete animal. So if, for example, if it was a gross mum, if it was a gross blemish, such as an animal that only had three legs, then they would say, I understand why you're not saying, it's not, it's, not, it's not respectful to the gods to give that kind. But a little mum, a little cut, incision in its eye, a little incision in its lip, ah, big deal. That they didn't see. They didn't deal or subscribe to the halachic status of mums, but they understood if it looked like a poor animal, a weak animal, a skinny animal, an unfed animal, undernourished, missing a limb, eh, that they could buy. You understand? What else? Yes. You know, it's very funny. Right, right. It's very funny that you say that. I, I want you to be honest with me. We don't see that today in the Jewish community. You don't see Jews once in a while getting really ticked off at someone in a community and they're willing to knock down the entire synagogue by the fact that they personally are insulted. We see it. Uh, maybe not in the Sephardic community as much. No, no, I'm, no I, I don't say that tongue-in-cheek. I say that seriously. I'm actually being serious. The Sephardim have something that the Ashkenazim do not have as much. It's called, they're a little more unified. The, Jewish, the Ashkenaz community doesn't have that as much. In the Ashkenaz community, you see it all the time. Unfortunately. Nebuch, you see it. There are Jews who are makber on their kavod. Uh, this, you know, how many times you don't hear all the time about breakaway minyanim? I'm going to make my own shul because I don't like... They're bringing down a community. They're not bringing down a community. Also bringing down a community. It's the same thing. What goes around comes around. Everything, all the rubbish that we've seen in Jewish history, unfortunately, repeats itself. So that doesn't bother me that much. Yes. So yes, so that's why Rabbi Yochanan, that's why Rabbi Yochanan criticizes him. Rabbi Yochanan says, you brought down the whole Jewish community. You, Rabbi Zechariah, because of your anvetanuto, your false modesty, your calculations, you're thinking halacha, and we're talking about people's emotions, right? A hundred percent. What? A hundred percent, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. So the question against Rabbi Zechariah ben of Kulas, that is a very obvious question. Agree with you. How could Rabbi Zechariah have made that mistake? Yes. Humility, false humility. Anvatanuto literally means humility, right? Or modesty, or humility. Let's say humility, it's fine, right? Like, Ve'aish Moshe anav mikol adam asher alpnei adama. Yeah, anav was modest, he was modest. But having said that, I don't believe that Rabbi Yochanan is, is calling him modest. Rabbi Yochanan is being sarcastic. He's saying, your modest, your humility caused the downfall of... Uh, uh, humility is a good thing. Rabbi Yochanan is using it sarcastically. Really? Okay. I. Okay. Okay. I. I disagree. I disagree. I. 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 I respectfully disagree. I. I don't believe that that's what Rabbi Yochanan is trying to say. But it could be. Could be. But what about questions on the story, Chevra? Come on. Let's start. Yes. Correct. Take it one step further. Let's take it one step further. Take it one step further. Here's a guy. Kamsa, the Gemara says, the Talmud says, Al Kamsa Ubar Kamsa, Chorva Yerushalayim. In all due respect, what did Kamsa do? The guy's sitting at home, he's watching his flat screen TV, you know, he doesn't get advice, he's sitting there innocently, eating his chips and dogs, and all of a sudden he hears that he's responsible for destroying the Beit HaMikdash. Ribano Shalalam. The poor Nebuch, he said it doesn't do anything. What do you want from Miskin? So he's attributed with destroying the Beit HaMikdash. What exactly did he do wrong? That's question number one. And not only that, by the way, look at how the Talmud lists them. The Talmud says, al Kamsa Ubar Kamsa, meaning, who's the main guy? Kamsa. Bar Kamsa also, but Kamsa's the main guy. Kamsa didn't do anything. He's sitting at home, he's not invited. Question number two. Why, if we attribute, as you mentioned, names, excuse me, Kamsa and Bar Kamsa, presumably, by the way, 
I, th that was not their names. I don't believe that that was their names, which we'll get to in a few moments. That was not their names. In fact, I don't believe that, <laughs> I don't believe that this entire story is true, okay? But I, I think the story is there for a reason. Uh, but hold on one second, let me, go ahead. Zechariah? Destroy the... Uh, so, okay, so you're disturbed by the same thing, right? So how could Rabbi Zechariah ben, ben Avkulas have been responsible? Agree. But let's take, it one, let's take a little further in terms of the beginning of the story, okay? Here you have, why is it that the Adon the one who invites, who's hosting the party, he has no name whatsoever. Why isn't he ascribed a name? If we were to say that Kamsa and Bar Kamsa were real names, the one guy who doesn't have a name is the guy who runs the party. He's anonymous. That's question number two. Question number three. Why did Bar Kamsa come? If Bar Kamsa is hated by this fellow, then presumably Bar Kamsa is not too peachy with him either, right? I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, what's it called? It's reciprocal, yeah? So if it's reciprocal, and, 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 you know, this guy hates him, so this guy also hates him. So why did Bar Kamsa come? What's the answer? Exactly. So you would say, well, maybe Bar Kamsa thought that the guy's being a nice guy, you know, he has his daughter's wedding, so it's a perfect opportunity to rectify the situation. So he's making shalom, he's making peace, he invites me to the Sa'uda. Okay, if that's the case, then what's the problem with that? What? He's not guilty? Well, okay, but he is guilty, right, exactly. Why is he guilty? Because what happens? He went in, and what did he do? Oh, he went in, and the first thing that he does is he eats. He's a real Jew, right? Jews are opposed to have food in front of them. They don't wait to say hello. They don't wait to say Shabbat Shalom. They don't wait to say, you know, they, it's, it, they go straight for the jugular. You go straight for the food, right? You put food in front of Jews, and they can't control themselves. It's like, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to bring up a sore point right now. We're all fasting, but this is, <laughs> that's not a very good thing. But, I mean, this is, this is what happens. By the way, I always say, you know, it's interesting. I go to speak in many different kihilot, in different communities, including the Sephardi communities. I'm like the one token Ashkenaz that they let in. So I, um, I have a, uh, it's very interesting. Since I'm not famous and no one, has, no one has any idea who I am. So when I first show up for Shabbat, uh, I always sit in the back. I sit in the back and before I speak, no one knows who I am, right? After I speak, then everyone's not, oh, oh, Rabbi Hammer, oh, such a nice speech, oh, beautiful, blah, 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 blah. But before I speak, they don't know who I am. So I sit in the back and I see, and I can see how the kahila, how the community acts. Because if they greet me and say hello, without knowing that I'm the speaker, but many times um, I'm just ignored, especially when it comes to the Kiddush. There's a Kiddush after davening. Nobody says Shabbat Shalom to you. Please, here's a plate. Come over here. Have something to eat. Feel, make yourself at home. Come on, make yourself at home. I come to your house. You're going to make me, make me feel at home, right? You maybe not, but you for sure, yeah? So sure enough, I mean, you come, you, you feel at a person's home. You come into a shul. You want to feel at home. They should greet you. They should treat you nicely. And, and, and many times I could see the, the behavior of the kila based on how they ignore me. After you speak, that's not a chiddush. People come over, they want to speak to you. Eh. But before, before they know who you are, that's a chiddush. And, and it's an amazing thing. Here's Bar Kamsa. The guy comes into this guy's party. If the guy invited him in the first place, it should have fallen in his head and realized that the guy's trying to make peace. He's trying to uh, facilitate a certain relationship, a rapport. And what does he do? Straight for the food. Doesn't say shalom aleichem. I want to thank you for inviting me to your party. You know, it's so nice. You make an effort to... And by the way, where's the, where's the beer? Oh, you go after... Huh? There are chagets. Ah, the guy wants to make sure so recognize him. And what does the guy do? Straight for the food. That's, so that's, that's a question. Why, why did that happen? Why did that happen? That's question number three. You know, four. What else? What else? I'll ask you another question. The shamash. The messenger of this guy, we don't know who he is, the messenger of the guy, he messes everything up. I mean, 
All the guy says to him is, go deliver this invitation to Kamsa. What does the guy do? He goes to Bar Kamsa. So you could tell me, eh, big deal, it's not the end of the world, he made a minor infraction. It's not a minor infraction. The guy is, is his entrusted servant. He doesn't know that his Adon, that his master, hates this guy Bar Kamsa's guts and loves this guy Kamsa. So he gets the address wrong? I mean, come on. How do you make such a gross miscalculation? Very difficult to understand. What's that? Which people? The messenger? Oh, we'll see why. We'll see why they're anonymous. We'll see why. Yes. Why doesn't he uh, rebuke him? Maybe he might have afterwards. We don't know. He might have afterwards. But that the Gemara doesn't tell us. Yes? Also legitimate. And finally, we get to the questions with regards to the rabbis. The big whopper question that all of you asked. I mean, the Gemara says, The rabbis are there and they don't do anything. What's with the rabbis? They, they can't react? They don't know that it's a good idea to say, you know, Hever, let's not behave this way. Give the guy a break. We'll help cover, the, we'll raise the money from the community. We'll help cover the, the cost. Leave him alone. It's, well, we'll see what they were doing. It's unbelievable. The rabbis don't, ah? Ah, nachom, pay money. Exactly right. By the way, that's what the Mephorshim say. We'll get there in a second. So it's unbelievable. They didn't, they, didn't, they didn't do anything. What's going on? And what was Rabbi Zechariah's miscalculation? So let's start like this. I, I'd like to begin with an analysis of the Pasuk. Ashrei Adam Efached Tamid. The Talmud tells us, where's my sheet? The Talmud tells us as follows. Look at the source number two. Hahu Talmide Dahave Ka'azil Batrei De Rabbi Shmuel Bar there was a Talmud, a student, who was walking after his Rebbe, Rabbi Yishmael Berbiosi, Bashuka de Tzion. Where's, where's a Shuka? What's a Shuka? Shuk! Where's Tzion? Yerushalayim. Nachon. So we're in Islam, Machane Yehuda. Yeah? They're walking Machane Yehuda. Chazia de Kamafchit. He saw that the, the student was afraid. Amar lechatat. You're a sinner for being afraid. Uh, uh, people who are afraid in Zion, in Yerushalayim, in, in Eretz, are chataim, are chotim, are sinners. I always, I always get a kick out of it. You know, I, I, I was in Europe recently, so, they, so the, their Jewish people actually said to me, they actually had the chutzpah to say to me, you know, I don't understand, you live in Israel, you're not afraid? I said, tell me something, are you normal? Have you seen what happened in Brussels, in Nice, in Paris, in Turkey? I mean, I, you're tell, calling me afraid? I'm more afraid here, walking around these places. I, I'm, I don't know what's going to be. In Israel, I feel safe. Meshugayim. My people uh, live an illusion lifestyle. So sure enough, what happens? Someone is afraid in Israel is a sinner. So the, the Talmud said back to the rabbi. But it says, You're supposed to always be afraid. No, my friend. Being consistently afraid refers only to divrei Torah. But uh, other things, you're not supposed to be afraid of. So the question becomes what, my friends? How do you qualify divrei Torah? What does it mean to be afraid of divrei Torah? Does it mean that I'm afraid that I'm going to forget the daf yomi? Does it mean that I'm, uh, I'm afraid that I'm going to be late to a shiur? Does it mean that half the Syrian community is afraid that they're missing Rabbi Hamashir this afternoon? Huh? That's something to be afraid of. So what exactly are we supposed to be afraid of with regards to Divrei Torah? Ma, what, what, what are we afraid of? What's going on? Very difficult to understand. So I saw a fascinating insight with the difference between these two psukim. And the Malbim, the Malbim says like this. Look, 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 look at the, uh, what is it? The third source. Tremendous. The third source, he says like this. Ashrei Adam Mefached Tamid. Great and praised is the person who was consistently afraid. Let's talk Hebrew grammar. What is the difference between pochid and mifachid? We, 
Well, even a little different than that. Pochet is making someone scared, right? Or Sorry, is someone who gets scared. Mifached is someone who makes himself scared. You hear? Mifached is a proactive. I decide to make myself afraid. Pochet is a reactionary. Yeah? I react by being afraid. But I didn't make myself consciously afraid. So, praised is the person who makes himself afraid. Says the Malbim, why would you make yourself afraid? So the Malbim says at the end of the verse, look what he says. He says, The person makes himself afraid on or with regards to the future that he should not sin. So I, I want you to appreciate this because this is really the mafteach, the key to understanding and appreciating the message. A person is meant to make himself afraid with regards to what is going to happen to me tomorrow. In other words, there are consequences to my decisions. There are consequences to my actions, and I have to be afraid of what might happen if I behave in a, certain, in a particular fashion. Do you follow me? For example, Chazal, in uh, Ethics of Our Fathers, Perkei Avot, what do they say? Ezehu chacham et anolad. Someone who sees the future. Obviously, it doesn't mean you see the future, but it means that you anticipate the consequences of my actions. I have a little uh, rambunctious little daughter, Kena Hara, she's 15 years old. She's, she's absolutely phenomenal. Uh, but she's exactly like me. It gets me so nervous. It, she's exactly like me. She is rambunctious. She has, she's vibrant. She's, she has uh, energy about her. You know, I'm not praising myself because there's a lot of problems with that. But the problem is that I, I remember myself when I was 15, I got into a heck of a lot of trouble, a lot of trouble. And the reason why is because when you're like that, you have to learn how to channel your energy in the right way. And you have to learn that there are consequences to your actions. So she reacts very quickly. And, she, and, and she's a phenomenal kid and everybody loves her. But sometimes she'll get into trouble because she takes it too far. And she doesn't think that if you do this, at this time, it's not a good idea. That takes what we call maturity, right? With time and maturity and growth, hopefully she'll learn that art. But there are people who unfortunately behave that way when they're 50. That's problematic. 15-year-old, eh, they'll grow up. 50-year-old, you don't have much time left. And when are you going to figure it out? That's problematic. And that is what the Malbim is saying. We are responsible for our actions. We cannot just think for the moment. We have to think and anticipate what's going to happen tomorrow if we behave in such a fashion. Here is the problem, my friends, with this entire portion of the Talmud. The Maharal says that Kamtza, the word Kamtza, which we classically refer to as a name, is actually comes from one of the actions that the Kohen performed in the Mikdash. Exactly. There are services that the Kohen performs in the Mikdash. Shechita, slaughtering. Hakrava, uh, offering the sacrifice. Zrika, sprinkling the blood. Kmitza. Kmitza is when a Kohen has to prepare a korban mincha, a mincha sacrifice. What does he do? He takes his hand and he goes like this, exactly. He goes like this and he takes the flower that is portioned from this part of his hand and that's what he uses for the korban mincha. In fact, by the way, to this day in modern Hebrew, this finger, this finger, yeah, is still called the kometz, the kmitza. That's what it's called. The coin is Kometz. So let me ask you something. When he's Kometz, when he does Kmitza, so what happens to the rest of the flower that's left? When he goes like this, he picks up the flower, what happens to the other flower? It falls down. Says the Maharal, that's why it was called Kamtza. 
Kamsa was someone who was divisive. Kamsa was someone who caused partitions, who caused breaks between the Jewish people. It represents someone who did not unify, but rather someone who divided, who caused machloket, who caused argument. Because you could tell me that Kamsa was sitting by himself and is lonesome watching TV at home and nothing. No! The very fact that Kamsa had a relationship with this fellow and knew that I love you, but I know that you hate my neighbor Bar Kamsa, that itself is problematic. It's indicative of what existed already in the Jewish community. And it's unacceptable. And that's why Kamsa is credited with being partly responsible in the destruction of the Mikdash. It's not Kamsa. It's us. We are Komtsim. We do Kmitsa. We differentiate. This guy, I like. This guy, I hate. This guy, I invite. This guy would never invite him in a million years. We made a daughter's wedding. I don't know anyone here who make a wedding. You know exactly how it works. The wife comes forward. She has a list of 500 people that she's inviting. And the husband sits there and says, I'm not inviting that guy. I don't have to invite that guy. Not only that guy. Stop it with this guy. Come on. You cut down the list to 250. The wife comes back and says, are you out of your mind? I'm inviting all 500. And you do. And you go to the wedding, and you look around at the wedding, and your daughter's getting married, and you're thinking, why on earth are some of these people at this wedding? <laughs> but that's human nature. The kmots, we are komtsim, kmitsa. We differentiate, we divide. Kamsa's responsible. And what happens? Amazing thing. Sure enough, we know that the adon, the leader, the head of this entire event, the fact that he is anonymous says something. The fact that he is anonymous, that he has no name, demonstrates to us that he's not interested. It doesn't really bother him. Things don't concern him. Anonymity is the lack of taking responsibility. If I'm responsible for my actions, then I step forward and I tell you my name. This is my name, this is what I've done, this is where I've gone wrong. But someone who's anonymous indicates that they are not interested in being responsible for their actions. And that's why the Talmud leaves him anonymous. It's a message to us. We're not interested. We're disconcerted with regards to the responsibility of our actions, the consequences of what we do. And then we have the Shamash. Here is someone who's meant to serve his master. And what does he do? He goes ahead and he delivers the message. He delivers the invitation to the wrong person. You know why? Because he also doesn't care. So what? So I give the invitation to Bar Kamsa instead of Kamsa. Eh, big deal. But it is a big deal. Because the next day Bar Kamsa comes along. And he's at the wedding, and there's a whole fanfare, and there's embarrassment, and that causes the destruction of the Mikdash. The lack of anticipation of consequences of our actions. That was the problem. And then Bar Kamsa comes to the party, doesn't think for a moment to go to the Adon, to go to the head of the meal, to say thank you for inviting me, go straight to the food. Could you imagine how burned this guy feels? Not only is the guy who he hates at the bar, he comes over to the guy, he says, excuse me, what are you doing here? The guy turns around, he goes, right? he's got like, he stuffed his face. You're eating my food. Mechutzaf. It reminds me of two things. It reminds me of Am Yisrael, if you remember, a few weeks ago, we read in Parshat Bahalotcha, the whole Maaseh of the, uh, of Zacharno et Adaga, Asher Echadu Mitzrayim. Right? We remember, the, oh, we remember the beautiful fiesta. We remember all of the food that we had in Mitzrayim. Bnei Yisrael say to Moshe, Bechinam. We ate the Shum et Avatichim. Bechinam. With no price. Ma pitom no price. You were slaves. Your babies were 
battered into the bricks. You felt lashes on your back. People were killed. Bechinam, you ate in Egypt. When it comes to eating, so, you know, the grass is greener on the other side. The Torah tells us that when B'nai Yisrael complained about the Slav, they complained about meat, they turned to Moshe, they say, Where's the beef? Remember that commercial? Was it, was that Wendy's? The old lady. Where's the beef? That's what B'nai Yisrael did. It's the same stuff. They turned to Moshe, they say, My, hey, where's the beef? And Moshe, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, sends them the Slav, this uh, bird. And what's unbelievable about this entire episode, it's unbelievable, I don't know, the Torah says, Habasar odenu ben shinehem. The meat was still stuck to their teeth. They didn't have time to use a placker. And their stomachs are exploding. And they're fressing away. They're eating the meat. They're concerned about the meat. And their stomachs are exploding. Unbelievable. But it's human nature. It indicates and it demonstrates someone who is not concerned with tomorrow. Right now, I want to eat meat. The fact that my stomach is going to explode and I'm going to die doesn't bother me right now. Unbelievable. And that's exactly what this Bar Kamsa demonstrates. When he doesn't, when all he does is eat, he doesn't think about the parameters of maybe going to this fellow Kamsa and asking him forgiveness and talking to him. And it, nothing. Because it doesn't concern him. And there's another reason why this Adon, this uh, leader of the party, why he doesn't have a name. Listen carefully. A name is ascribed to someone who has been successful in their lives. A name is ascribed to someone who has completed and fulfilled their mission. Where do we see this? Moshe Rabbeinu. The Torah tells us, Vayikach ish mibet levi, isha mibet levi. You remember, when Moshe was born, it says a man from the house of Levi takes a woman from the house of Levi, but we don't know their names. We know their names. What are their names? Amram and Yocheved, yeah? But we only know after the fact. In Perek Bet, before Moshe assumes the position of being the leader of Am Yisrael, they are only called the man from house of Levi takes the woman from the house of Levi. But in Perek Vov, later on, after a few chapters, the Torah tells us, Vaikach Amram et Yocheved dodato. Amram takes Yocheved. Why are they ascribed names now? The reason why is because now it is after Moshe has assumed the mantle of leadership. Moshe now has already, to a certain extent, fulfilled his mission. He's accepted his mission to take Bnei Yisrael out of Eretz Mitzrayim. So now they can be given names. Amram and Yocheved. But before you complete a mission, before you've demonstrated that you've contributed something to this world, you are anonymous. This fellow in the Talmud is anonymous. He has not completed anything. He has not contributed anything. And therefore he's ascribed anonymity. And finally we get to the Rabbanim. What happened with the Rabbanim? So this is something that all of you asked. Firstly, why did the Rabbanim not react? I mean, you're talking about Malbim Prechavero Barabim. Embarrassing this fellow in public. Terrible. Why didn't they react? Listen carefully to this. Amazing. There are commentaries who suggest that the reason why is because the fellow who was hosting the party was extremely wealthy. Who's going to tick off the wealthy guy? The rabbis aren't going to. If the rabbis want to come on Sunday morning, and get their donation for the yeshiva. So you don't take on the wealthy people. I see this all the time in the Jewish community. It is unbelievable. There's a saying, by the way, I don't, know, I don't think it's in Chazal. It's a saying in Hebrew. You ever hear it? It's called Baal Hamea Baal Hadea. Guy who has the $100 bill, he's the guy who makes the decisions. Money talks. You call it in English, money talks. Yeah? But it's not supposed to in Judaism. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's not supposed to dictate policy in Judaism. I've been to many small communities throughout the United States. It's amazing. In these small communities, there's always like one or two gvirim, like one or two rich guys who contribute everything to the community. You know, they give the school, they give the shul, they give the Jewish community center. Everything is from them. So uh, sometimes it's okay, but usually not. Why? Because they feel that since they've contributed everything, they are experts in Jewish education. So they can say every decision that should happen in the school because they gave the money. And they can say every decision that should happen in the synagogue, in the shul, because they gave the money. The degradation, the debasement of someone's personality. And the rabbis do not think about the consequences. I may have my yeshiva today, and the rich guy is giving me money today, but tomorrow the Roman Empire is going to destroy it. And it won't make any difference who has money and who doesn't, because none of us will have anything. That is the point of the story. That is the entire point of the story. And Rav Zechariah ben Avkulas, who's only mentioned in this story, there's a reason. Because he failed. He failed as a leader. He failed as the head of the Jewish community. I saw a fascinating thing. The Gemara says that when in time of the Mashiach, Pnei hador ke pnei ha-kelev. You ever hear that expression? Pnei hador ke pnei ha-kelev. The face of the nation... Wasn't there a game show like that once? Face of the Nation? Isn't there something? Anyway, let me see. The face of the nation will be like the face of dogs. Look, what, what does that mean? So Rabbi Yisrael Salanter explains like this. A person takes a dog. The dog, if you lead a dog on your leash, the dog always walks ahead of you, correct? Dog always walks ahead. So the dog presumably is leading you. But the dog always looks behind him to see where his master is. He always looks behind him. Where's my master? What's going on? What's he doing? And what would they say about someone, about killing someone for bringing about a mum, a blemish? In it? Please, please, stop with the halacha calculations. Be a man and stand up and say this is unacceptable behavior. We, the rabbis, don't approve. This won't happen in our community. But he doesn't. He doesn't have the gusto to do it. And therefore he's unfit for, work, for leadership. And the Tzava, the Israeli army, is the famous bitui, a famous expression that all of you are familiar with. Officers in the army, Acharai, I go first. You guys come after me. An officer goes first. Our son is trained to, training to be an officer in the Israeli army. I don't want him to go first. I want him to go last. I'm selfish. It's my son. I don't want anything chas v'shalom. I don't want him to be first. But if he wants to be a leader, he has to go first. That's what leaders are, regardless of the price. And this is the message of the Gemara. The Talmud wants us to understand that if we cannot take responsibility for our actions and recognize that there are consequences to what we do, then we are not fit to be a Jewish community. Then it leads to destruction. And in fact, it's fascinating. If you look at the last source on your sheet, it's an amazing thing. The last source on your sheet is the exact same Talmud 
but it's taken from, I'm sorry, exact same story, but it's taken from Eicha Raba, second, source, second to last source. It's taken from the Medrash Eicha Raba. And what does it say at the end? The entire story is repeated, same story. But then it says, V'haya sham Rab Zechariah ben Avkulas. V'hayta safek biyadol limchot v'lomicha. It doesn't say that all the rabbis were there and they were unsure what to do. It says Rab Zechariah ben Avkulas was there and he didn't know what to do. So yes, he is responsible. And this is the message of the Gemara. So my friends, it is my hope and prayer the Talmud tells us, Every single generation that doesn't witness the reconstruction of the temple, it's as if it has been destroyed in your generation. The temple's been destroyed in our generation. Why? Because it hasn't been rebuilt. It is my hope and prayer that we can embrace responsibility, that we can embrace unity, that we can understand and appreciate the consequences of our actions and that we should be more meticulous in terms of how all of us, and I of course include myself, all of us in the Jewish world should behave. And hopefully as a result of our embracing this responsibility, we'll be able to not only witness, but be able to facilitate the Binyan Beit HaMikdash. B'meir Rabbi Amenu Amen. I have here, by the way, just uh, very quickly, I have here a few of my books available for sale and part of the proceeds go to our unit in the Israeli army. For those of you who would like to make a contribution to our unit in the Israeli army, for those of you who would like to buy a book and help our unit in the Israeli army, you're more than welcome to do so. You're not obligated, but would be most appreciated. I don't get commission. It doesn't go to overhead. It goes directly to the Chayalim. One of them is my son, and we should hear B'Sarot Tovot. They protect us. We are obligated to protect them. I uh, look forward to hearing only good things. Thank you very much.